Good morning, this is Dana Parsons and welcome to the coronavirus weekly member update call. Before we get started uh, with our presenters today, I wanted to let everyone know on the call that our next call on Wednesday, February 17th is going to address employee vaccine policies to mandate or not mandate. We um, have been receiving a lot of questions and concerns around this issue, and so that is going to be the focus of our next call. So I wanted to make sure that you all were aware of that, and we will have more information about that. A call that will be in our updates um, for tomorrow and next week. So be sure to look out for those. So with that said, um, while we um, are listening um, to our presenters today from the Department of Health and Dr. Jim Wright, I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind sharing what your employee vaccination percentages are. So we've been hearing from communities, um, different overall percentages of those employees that have been receiving the vaccine. And I think everyone is a little interested in knowing how that's going. So if you don't mind sharing that in the chat box, that would be great. So now we're going to hear from Mike Magner with the Department of Health, who is going to be providing us with an update. So over to you, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning. Can you hear me right now? Yes, I hear you very well. Okay, good. All right, I just wanted to make sure I didn't have to hit another combination of uh, symbols and, and numbers. All right, so uh, real quick, so the Long-Term Care Pharmacy Partnership Program with uh, CVS and Walgreens uh, has been moving along. So as of uh, February 8th, uh, they were reporting that 100% of their skilled nursing facilities assigned to them have completed their first dose, and 90% have already completed their second dose. And, and some facilities have even started to get third dose events um, initiated either this week or early next week. Um, and then among our, what we call assisted living facilities, which really that number there includes assisted living facilities and quote others, um, which includes a variety of other facilities that also signed up. 93% of them have completed their first dose events um, and 25% have completed their second dose events. Um, and then total vaccines provided first and second dose is 147,873. Um, they have been allocated about 249,000 doses uh, for that project, so you can kind of look at that in terms of where they are. Uh, there is a bit of a lag time, so we, we get um, data about clinics that are completed um, prior to the number of doses actually being added to the system. So the, the number of doses provided tends to be behind uh, the number of provided events. So we think actually they provided a lot more doses than that. Um, a lot of questions about third clinic events. So the intent for the third clinic event was that these would be second dose events for people who have already gotten first dose events. Um, will they provide first doses to people who are, you know, for whatever reason didn't get their first dose um, in the first two clinic events? The answer is yes, they will. Um, however, they are providing the disclaimer that they're not planning to come back a fourth time to the facility to provide those people with second doses. So it's really the facility, if they want to start people on Pfizer for first doses at that third clinic event. Um, and, and the challenge is how can we link those um, individuals up for a, a second dose if CVS and Walgreens are not coming back. And that's the challenge, and, and, and at the, you know, Virginia Department of Health, um, you know, early on in the planning phase, we assumed that by this time in, in late February, early March, um, those vaccine doses would be available at, at many of the, the pharmacy chains, both the national pharmacy chains and also our local pharmacies through state level agreements. However, the vaccine supply coming to Virginia has just not been great enough that we can turn on those, those faucets, those avenues um, for vaccine in the community. So where can people get vaccine for their second doses if they have already gotten first doses with one of these events? Um, one option 
to work with um, local hospitals. A lot of the hospitals have um, these vaccine doses available. Um, and some of the national pharmacy chain partnerships are coming online, so CVS is getting some allocations for vaccine. However, I understand all of their appointments for all 26,000 doses that, that are starting tomorrow have already been filled. <laughs> like they've already, they've already got enough people signed up that they could give all that vaccine away um, and not have any left over. They will continue to get additional weekly allocations. Um, local health departments in some places have started to get Pfizer vaccine. Um, this has been kind of hit or miss. It's based on whether or not they've received their freezers that they ordered back in December and we're all on back order. Um, and if they have the capability to store it, they're not getting huge amounts of this vaccine. But one avenue um, that a long-term care facility can do is to you know, set up a provider agreement and a redistribution so if they only need, you know, 20 doses or 30 doses to meet the needs of a, a small number of people that still need second doses, they can get a, a reallocation of vaccine and then administer the doses themselves. So that's that's one option. Or if they have a pharmacy partner, they can either order vaccine directly through the pharmacy partner or have the pharmacy partner get a reallocation um, from a local health district or hospital. Not not real easy, but I think we don't have a one size solution. Um, at the state health department that's going to solve all of the problems for all the facilities. So really need local coordination between the facilities and, and local hospitals and health districts to try and work that out. So I'll, I'll pause and see if there's any questions in the chat regarding that, um, what we've gone over so far. Melissa, are there any questions? Nope, no questions yet. Okay. And then I'll just jump on to my, my last point. Um, there are still a large, not a large number, but a small number of long-term care facilities that are not included in the CDC Federal Pharmacy Partnership with, with Walgreens and CVS. And so we have a, a central office team that is working directly with independent pharmacies um, to vaccinate these facilities. And this includes uh, independent living facilities, um, independent care facilities for individuals with uh, developmental disabilities or ICF, IDDs, um, and even some, some senior housing complexes and others. This is kind of a patchwork solution because some of the local health districts have already reached out to these facilities and, and provided vaccine. Some of these were actually included in the, the CVS Walgreens partnership if they enrolled back in November. Um, but we are trying to reach out to these facilities and identify, um, you know, any ones that, that are still missing vaccine. Um, but if you guys have facilities that are in this category, please reach out to me, and you can reach out either through Dana or, um, you know, directly to me, um, and we'll try and get them linked up. Um, we do have lots of pharmacies throughout the state that have already uh, signed the the partnership agreement for the COVID vaccine, and so they're ready to go. Um, and we're using primarily Moderna vaccine for this project because that's, that's what we have available, and the, the dose orders that we're allocating for this are, are too small to use the Pfizer vaccine. And uh, that's all I have on the slides, uh, pending any questions. So, Mike, just to clarify that for those who are looking for access to vaccine as new staff and residents join the campus, they should be working through their local pharmacy partner that they um, through their, their either their their county health health district or the pharmacy partner they were assigned when um, VDH sent out that list of pharmacies and, and independent living, correct? Yes. So. Um... I mean, it really, you know, they they don't they're not assigned any specific pharmacy that they have to work with. I know that a lot of um, the facilities have their own relationships with either a pharmacy in house or a a pharmacy they typically work through to get, you know, say the flu vaccine or, or the pneumonia vaccine. Um, and and I would just recommend that they they start with those partners, and if they they can't get any any luck through there, then they can reach out to hospitals and local health departments as well. 
again, you know, we don't have a, a one-size-fits-all solution. I think it's going to be more of a patchwork solution um, at the local health department level. Great. Thank you. No more questions so far, Dana. Well, thanks, Mike. We really appreciate the update and all that you're doing uh, for us. Uh, we really do appreciate it. I don't see any other questions at this time, but we hope that you can remain on in case any um, do come up. But we have the great opportunity to have Dr. Jim Wright uh, speak with us now. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Real quick, I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt. I just thought of something that, yes. that I didn't put on the slide, but I did want to make everyone aware of. Um, VDH is planning to send out a uh, survey um, to the long-term care facilities asking about their their census and their vaccination coverage. And it's really, we're really interested in learning, you know, not only which facilities were able to get vaccinated, but what percent coverage they were able to attain for both staff and residents. So the only data that we're getting back from CD, you know, the CDC program through CVS and Walgreens is, is how many doses they administered at each facility, and we're not even sure that that data is reliable, but it doesn't give us any kind of sense of what actual vaccine coverage they have. So we're really interested in that data. So when the survey comes out, we do urge everyone to please complete the survey and, um, and send that back. That's all I have, thanks. Hey Mike, another question just came in. So with regards to that third clinic, if they um, take a leap of faith and have you know, people given that first dose, but then there's no vaccine to get the second dose, um, that, that's a wasted dose. So um, given that there's a, a lull in, in vaccines or a lag, I should say, in vaccine availability, what advice would you give them? So, you know, my recommendation would always be to err on the side of, you know, vaccinating people versus not vaccinating them. So we do know that that one dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine is is a lot more effective than zero doses. And some estimates show about 60% effectiveness just for that, that one dose, single dose shot. Um, also, um, CDC is also looking at that, that requirement that the second dose be administered in 21 days. Um, they really think that, you know, 21 days is the ideal for the second dose, but that if you, um, aren't able to get the second dose in 21 days and it's at some point longer. I think they're saying now like up to 90 days, it's still effective. You know, that's, I wouldn't recommend waiting for that 90 days, but certainly would err on the side of getting people vaccinated. And then also I'm hearing that there may be some new guidance coming out that says you can possibly do the second dose with the other vaccine. So if you got Pfizer on dose one, uh, Moderna on dose two, um, will be okay. We we don't have that definitive guidance in writing yet, but we are seeing that that may come out soon as well. So I would, my, my um, advice would be to err on getting people vaccinated versus uh, deferring them just because you're not sure about the second dose. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks again, Mike. So we are going to move over to our discussion about the use of antibodies um, in long-term care. So over to you, Dr. Wright. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Um, hi, everybody. Good to be talking with you again. We're going to uh, talk today about a new uh, opportunity for treatment for coronavirus in uh, long-term care and skilled rehab settings. Uh, the use of monoclonal antibodies. I uh, just want to go back uh, before that, though, and and um, I'm posting, you, you caught me in the middle of uh, posting in the chat box. Um, the CDC did just come out uh, a couple of weeks ago with um, guidelines on how to uh, delay and whether you could delay that second dose by up to six weeks is what they're saying at this point. And I put the uh, the link in the chat box. Uh, they do also, um, as Chris mentioned, they do uh, say that in, in exceptional circumstances, as they say, you can mix vaccines. So if you get the Pfizer first, uh, if it's an exceptional circumstance, after 28 days, you could get the Moderna. 
but ideally you would want to stick with the same dose. So that, that'll be a, a, a good link to explore uh, that I just posted in the chat box. So, um, so we're going to talk today about the use of monoclonal antibodies. Um, these slides were compiled by uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. David Nace. He's a geriatrician and the current president of AMDA uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about what they are, um, why use them, uh, who are candidates for monoclonal antibodies, uh, what you need to kind of put together in order to prescribe and administer, and uh, the last question, can you provide this treatment in post-acute long-term care settings? The answer is yes. Um, I'll have members of my team, uh, Brent Huseman, and, uh, who's my administrator, and my director of nursing, Malika Johnson, on today to talk about uh, how we were able to administer uh, monoclonal antibodies here at Our Lady of Hope. Next slide, please. So uh, the... The important thing about this picture, we all know the COVID virus has those little spike proteins um, and they get into your cells and cause trouble uh, by binding to a receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And this is a receptor that uh, we use for um, affecting uh, 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 blood pressure. ACE inhibitors uh, use this, but the ACE2 receptor is on the human cells. It allows the uh, protein to bind and the uh, and the virus to inject its RNA into your cells, so it reproduces. Uh, that's that's the the basic way that the uh, coronavirus works. Next slide, please. So monoclonal antibodies, how they work, is by preventing. Uh, next slide by preventing uh, this spike protein binding to the ACE receptor. So if you have an antibody, whether it is a monoclonal antibody that you administer to a patient or whether it is antibodies that you produce yourself, it binds to the spike protein and it blocks attachment to the ACE2 receptor. It blocks the attachment to a, a human cell and prevents the virus from injecting the RNA into the human cell. So that's how neutralizing antibodies work in the uh, in the setting of COVID. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of different products that are available right now. Um, and actually, there is a third product that just received uh, emergency use authorization. It's a combination of uh, banlinivam, and, and no one can say these words, and another, uh, another uh, medication called estazomib, as Tezava Bam, um, uh, and, and studies have shown that those combinations of monoclonal antibodies may work better than uh, Bam Manolidavam uh, by itself. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to probably just say monoclonal antibody infusion instead of the actual name. Um, so, who is uh, appropriate for monoclonal antibodies? Well, the the EUA. Um, gave permission for us to use monoclonal antibodies in adults or children greater than 12 years of age um, that have identified coronavirus disease and are at risk for progressing to severe COVID-19 or hospitalization within 10 days of symptom onset. And we're, of course, just going to talk about adults. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, what are the benefits? So. Uh, I, I want to kind of pause here to say that the evidence to support the use of monoclonal antibodies is still not as robust as we would like. It's still pretty slim. Um, granted, there have been um, about uh, more than a thousand people in studies with monoclonal antibodies, and now much more than that uh, with a combination of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, the, the studies look promising, but there are not as many people, for example, that were in the studies for the Pfizer and the, the Moderna vaccine. There were tens of thousands of people, uh, and we have thousands of people involved in these studies. However, the results do look promising in that it, in, in subjects that receive the monoclonal antibody, it did tend to decrease their risk for hospitalization and their progression to severe disease. And I will say that I've been 
holding the line during the past 10 months in all these recommended treatments for coronavirus, such as the Plaquenil or the Ivermectin, uh, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D. Um, I have not instituted those treatments at any of my facilities um, because I didn't feel the studies uh, really supported their use. Uh, and they also did not really make much sense in how they would work. Uh, I looked at the studies for monoclonal antibodies, uh, and the, the, the evidence in these small studies did make me feel that this is something that would be very beneficial or potentially beneficial for my patients. A. B, it makes sense. You're simply putting in antibodies that your body is going to make anyway. You're putting them in at a greater dose than you're able to make them in the early stages of coronavirus, and you are doing the job that your body would normally do if it was immune from coronavirus disease. So it makes sense. Uh, it makes sense that it would decrease the progression to severe disease and hospitalization. So that's why we started using it at Our Lady of Hope. Um, now, uh, the studies show that it did not help hospitalized patients. And so actually, the doses we received were from a, a, a hospital in Lynchburg, uh, and uh, it's because they were using it at one point and stopped using it because it, it was found not to be helpful once your disease is that severe. So this is really for mild to moderate disease in an outpatient setting. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> these two studies um, that are detailed here uh, had uh, hundreds um, of people in each study. Uh, and the important thing to look at is the number that's highlighted in blue. Number needed to treat to avoid one hospitalization. So for the, uh, the monoclonal antibody on the left, the bam bam it's 12.5 people needed to treat to prevent a hospitalization. And for the other combination, it's 16.4. Um, and, and the way to think about it is uh, this is actually really, really good. Just 12.5 people needed to receive the treatment to prevent one person from going to the hospital. In comparison, uh, uh, statins like Lipitor, Zocor, numbers needed to treat to prevent a cardiac event like a heart attack are uh, anywhere between 80 to 100. Okay, so there are uh, medications that we use that have a much higher number needed to treat, and we still use them. Uh, these studies showed pretty low numbers needed to treat in order to see benefits. So these studies were very promising. Okay, next. Uh, but you, uh, like we said, can't use these in people that are hospitalized. Uh, if someone is requiring oxygen, they are no longer mild to moderately ill. They're now in the severely ill stage, and you can't use it in someone that needs oxygen. Now, the uh, caveat would be if someone is on chronic oxygen therapy, that doesn't prevent you from using it as long as their oxygen therapy uh, or the need for oxygen is not worsening. So as long, you know, if it's chronic two liters nasal cannula, and that has not changed, you can still use monoclonal antibodies on those patients. Okay, next. Who are high risk? Well, all of our patients, right? Anyone that's greater than or equal to 65 years of age, or if they're younger and they have hypertension or cardiovascular disease, COPD, uh, somebody that's obese, chronic kidney disease, diabetes. So all of our patients are at high risk, as we all know. Next, please. Side effects um, are pretty minimal. Nausea, diarrhea is the, kind of the side effects you see for any medications. Uh, there was one case of anaphylaxis uh, in the bamilivam group, uh, but that was in hundreds of people. Um, next, please. So the administration, <clears throat> um, and we're going to kind of go through the practical steps in administering this medication later, but um, it's Pretty straightforward. Um, it takes an hour to infuse. You use an IV pump, at least we used an IV pump, and you set it to a, a certain rate that's kind of contained in all the information you get with the medication. Uh, the pump was supplied by our long-term care pharmacy. Uh, it's pre-mixed. Um, it comes to you in a freezer bag. You remove it from the freezer bag, warm it up at room temperature for at least 20 minutes. 
and then you're ready to go. Um, you use a filtered line that also comes with the uh, medication as well. Next, please. Now, um, this is not something that you can simply order and give. Uh, you do have to have involvement of your medical team, your MD, your nurse practitioner, your DO, your PA. They have to talk to the patient or the family if the patient does not have capacity, and they have to go over the benefits and the risks of using monoclonal antibody therapy. They also have to give the patient or the family or both a fact sheet that the family has to review, and then only after they've had time to review it and talk about the risks and the benefits can they give permission? So it is a little bit uh, time intensive uh, on everyone's part, but the clinician has to be very involved in getting permission uh, from the patient or family. Next, please. So um, the post-acute long-term care setting is the optimal place to give this. I mean, we have RNs, we have the ability to give uh, IV, uh, medications already. Uh, we have connections with our long-term care pharmacy that has the supply. Um, so it is something we already do for other medications, and this is an ideal place, an optimal place uh, to give our patients a medication that could potentially save their lives and prevent hospitalizations. Um, it is FDA authorized uh, under a EUA authorization. It is investigational, so currently studies are ongoing. And actually, a recent study came out that shows even greater promise than bamlivibam on its own. It's in combination with another uh, monoclonal antibody, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so we may have uh, even a more effective treatment to offer uh, sometime soon. It is not experimental. Uh, so there's already been clinical trials uh, conducted to look at benefits and risks. So it's not experimental. We already know that it has benefit. Next, please. Um, and then more information. This is a really good uh, resource for everybody. If you want to click on this link, it not only has information about the monoclonal antibody therapy, but it also has all the documents that you're going to need, the order sets and the fact sheets and the uh, list of equipment and training and things like that. So this is, uh, if you're interested in exploring the use of monoclonal antibody therapy in your facility, connect to this link. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, um, I'm just gonna talk about our experience and I'd uh, like my uh, administrator and director of nursing to uh, come on if you wanna activate your videos. We're, we're in the same building, but we're, in different rooms uh, because I didn't want them to be uh, around me while I was talking and spouting all this you know, vapor. We're, we're here. We're here. Okay, great. So Brant and Malik are, are uh, on board here. Um, so um, our experience uh, was during our outbreak, and uh, as fate would have it, our outbreak began around December 23rd, uh, maybe 22nd. Um, we... Uh, ended up having a, a number of people with coronavirus. Uh, and uh, we had heard about the monoclonal therapy. Um, I'd heard on some uh, national conversations that I'd been having with other medical directors. And we decided to investigate. Uh, at that time, the monoclonal antibody therapy was not available through uh, our long-term care pharmacy, which is Omnicare, um, but the state had a task force that was uh, very helpful in obtaining the monoclonal antibodies uh, and, and getting it to us. And eventually, um, Omnicare uh, was able to obtain its own supply. And so it's a lot uh, less work now to actually get the medication. You simply order it from your long-term care pharmacy. But I would say the most important thing first is teamwork. Um, I went to Malika, my director of nursing, and asked her if she thought we were up to it first. Um, I told her about it, and she'd heard about it, and, and she said immediately, yes, we're ready. And this was in the middle of an outbreak, and I know you all, most of you have been through an outbreak, and you know what, what that's like. You know uh, how the uh, resources are really strained, staffing is really strained, uh, you do have to have an RN 
that can administer this and receive training. Uh, but uh, Malika stepped up to the challenge and we were able to assemble a team uh, that day. Uh, and uh, we were ready to, to administer the uh, monoclonal antibody within, I would say, one to two days. Um, training. It was about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and we received training online through our long-term care pharmacy. Uh, the staff you will need, and, and I'll tell you what we used, um, we either had uh, a, uh, an MD, myself, or a, a PA uh, on site monitoring the patient during the infusion, and we also had an RN administering the uh, monoclonal antibody as well. It's about three hours of time if you're talking a uh, setup, an hour for the infusion, and then a required hour of monitoring following the infusion. Next, please. Um, the paperwork, which is available on the link that I sent you and also available from your long-term care pharmacy. Uh, you need the fact sheet because the family and the patient need to read that, uh, a checklist, uh, of things that need to be put in place, an order set and monitoring sheet. Uh, the monitoring sheet we used uh, because you have to record a full set of vitals every 15 minutes during the infusion and after the infusion, and we would scan that into the chart after we completed our infusion. Next, please. Um, so uh, most importantly, your clinician, your MD or your nurse practitioner will need to identify the appropriate patients. The best patient is a patient that is mildly to moderately ill, whose results have just come back within the past three days or who has just become symptomatic within the past three days. The earlier you give the monoclonal antibody, the better. You can wait up till 10 days after the start of symptoms, but it's ideal to give it within the first three days. They uh, can't be in need of oxygen if they're usually not in need of oxygen. Um, and if you are uh, considering sending them to the hospital, uh, then they are probably too ill. So moderate, mild to moderate symptoms. IV access, I'll tell you that this is uh, very important. Um, the pharmacy would not send us, and appropriately so, they would not send us the monoclonal antibody infusion until we could tell them we had IV access. And so we all got really good. We, we administered monoclonal antibodies uh, to 10 of our patients. We, got, we all shared the duty. I put in IVs, my PA put in IVs, uh, Malika put in IVs, and other RNs on our staff put in IVs as well. Um, we uh, eventually got to a kind of a system where we would place the IV uh, the night before uh, and give orders to flush it. And then uh, we would call the pharmacy that evening and say, okay, we've got two people with IVs. Um, can you all mix it and send it to us tomorrow morning? And that was the quickest way to get our infusions done. Um, you need space. So you need to be able to monitor these patients. And we were lucky to have an unused dining area next to our nurse's station. And so we could set up a couple of beds there and we were able to infuse our uh, monoclonal antibody infusion uh, right there. So we had plenty of people around uh, able to monitor, but the RN and the usually the MD uh, were, were there in the dining room monitoring the entire time. Um, you will need an anaphylaxis kit. So you heard in that one study, uh, one patient did have an anaphylactic reaction. None of ours had any anaphylaxis, but we were ready. We had an anaphylactic kit that was provided to us by our long-term care pharmacy, and that included uh, injectable epinephrine, uh, injectable uh, solumedrol, as well as uh, Benadryl. Uh, next. And um, that is, um, that's our um, presentation. Um, I'm open for any questions or uh, also Malika or Brant, if you have anything to add from your perspective, that would be helpful. Yeah, we're here to help answer any questions, Dr. Wright. Um, from my perspective as administrator, it was listening to Dr. Wright and Malika, listening to what they needed and, um, as you know, if you're in an outbreak, you're there working the floor or there anyway. So it was, I took the role of making sure they had what they needed when they needed it. Um, you know, we huddled every day to discuss 
what the next day would bring and then making sure that that little triage center that we set up in the dining room was ready and available with everything they needed for that for those infusions to be given. Well, I'd like to add that all of the uh, residents who received the infusion had great outcomes. Um, so they're, you know, they all came through and they were able to go back onto the regular nursing center floor. That was a plus. And I will tell you that the pharmacy worked with us um, really closely to make sure that we understood and we were trained on how to give this infusion. Um, they provided us with everything we needed. Um, like Dr. Wright said, we just had to make sure that we had a site available um, before the infusion arrived, the, the IV arrived, and, and that was about it. Um, I have a couple of questions I saw, uh, one from uh, John Burns at Westminster Canterbury. Um, the question is, John was asking uh, the reaction of patients and or families to this treatment. Good question. So, you know, you're coming to families in the middle of a, you know, a crisis and you're saying, okay, I have this new medication that has been shown in a small number of patients to reduce the risk of progression to severe disease and, regroup and reduce risk of hospitalization. Um, and here's the fact sheet. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, it, I, I will say um, there was only one family that refused it, first of all, uh, out of the uh, 11 people that we approached uh, to this. Some families took longer than others. Uh, some families wanted to look at the fact sheet overnight and talk about it with their other family members. I had some that were uh, by the end of my conversation or, or even before they would interrupt me and say, I'm, I'm just go ahead and give it. Um, I said, well, I have to give you the fact sheet first. So, uh, but, but some were very eager. Uh, the vast majority um, took advantage of it. And, I, I, you know, I would say a lot of it has to do with the level of trust that they already have in your care. Um, it is probably more prevalent on the news now. You're hearing a little bit more about it, and so it might be a little bit easier. But, it, you know, it can be tough for families hearing about a, a new treatment. Um, I made sure I did not use the word experimental because it's not. Uh, but I did make sure they knew it was uh, only tested in a small number of people, relatively small. Um, and then the other question, which is important, that uh, Dana was asking, what about reimbursement? Medicare reimburses, I'm almost positive it's $390 per infusion. And that goes to the facility. Uh, and that can very well help to cover. I mean, if you're doing uh, two patients at once, uh, and you get $390 for each infusion, that could cover your costs, certainly, and, and more than that. Um, Bran or Malik, do you have anything to add about the family reaction or the reimbursement? Not really. No, I can't. No, I think they're all very happy with the outcomes. Again, they, um, I believe we made a difference with this therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all did graduate off the of COVID unit back to their regular rooms. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say we saved lives through this. Dr. Wright saved some lives I, through this I agree. therapy. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, every single one uh, did well. And of course, not everyone did well. Uh, that had coronavirus, uh, some people c became severely ill, but uh, those that received monoclonal antibody did not become severely ill. So uh, I know that's a small number, 10, uh, but I can tell you we all saw, uh, and in some cases we saw almost immediate improvement in symptoms, you know, that day. So um, I'm very encouraged that, uh, you know, or, or convinced that we're going to see uh, continued results coming out from studies that will um, that will uh, underlie its its continued use. Um, so um, Karen Riley asked if someone had the vaccine and had COVID symptoms with a positive test, could that person get uh, the monoclonal antibody infusion? So there is a caveat that says. And this is important to know, if you've had the monoclonal antibody infusion, you're not supposed to receive the vaccine 90 days afterwards. The reason there's a, a, a warning about this is that they're not sure that the vaccine will work if you have monoclonal antibodies floating around from your infusion. It's not that it's dangerous. And so 
yes, it would be uh, advisable to go ahead and explore using monoclonal antibody uh, infusion, even if someone has had the, the vaccine. Uh, it simply means that you've not been able to mount, or to mount an immune response to the infection, uh, even though you've had that first vaccine. And this monoclonal antibody infusion is going to help with that. It's certainly not going to harm you. Um, how did our state inspector respond? But we've not had an inspection, to my knowledge. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah, we've we, not had an inspection since. During this time, we have had, you know, the on-site infection control since these. Well, I guess we have had them. We have had one. Um, and yeah. they were just uh, impressed. And I think they basically said, wow, that's great. Okay. Um, that's not much question. response other than that yeah. and not much other proof needed. Um, and... Yeah, it, you know, they take their uh, samples of residents and they, of course, if they're interested in it, they would ask for that documentation based on, you know, what's in the medical record. Uh, and and Will Blackwell was asking, what's the cost from the pharmacy? So that's that's another good question. The um, monoclonal antibody infusion is, is uh, the cost of the infusion. The medicine itself is covered by uh, the federal government. So for the medication, there's no cost. Uh, it, the cost is simply the um, the tubing, and maybe there's a rental fee for the pump. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yep. Well, thank you, Dr. Wright. Well, it just sounds like uh, such a promising uh, therapy. I, I wanted to ask, um, if there were any more questions or if anyone wanted to come off of mute to ask any questions related to this. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Okay, well, hearing none. Um, Dr. Wright, did you have anything else um, that you wanted to add? Um, not really. I mean, I, I think during this whole outbreak um I'll, I'll just make a plug i guess during this whole outbreak um it has become i think apparent to everyone that involvement of your medical director an involved uh trained medical director is really important in guiding um facilities through a crisis like this so um you know medical directors uh, have been talking, you know, my, my group, AMDA, we've been talking about uh, how, you know, the role of medical director is not as well known uh, in, in public or even in, uh, in facilities themselves. And um, I'll, I'll just make a, a plug. I think we, we have realized and recognized during the past uh, 10 to 12 months that the, an active involved medical director is, uh, is really important to the health of your facility and the health of your patients. So. Oh, there's one question. How does this compare to convalescent plasma? Um, good question. So convalescent plasma is uh, kind of the same thing, although convalescent plasma is uh, basically monoclonal antibodies that are made by a person. Uh, the monoclonal antibody infusion, the bamilitabam, is made in a laboratory, okay? But it's the same concept. Uh, they are still using convalescent plasma in hospitals. I think it's been shown to be a little bit more, well, it's been shown to be more effective than the monoclonal antibody infusion made in the lab in the hospital setting, but same concept. You're using those antibodies to bind to the virus to prevent it from getting into the cells. And Dr. Wright, we have a comment here. Great job, Dr. Wright and Our Lady of Hope. So it was all, all teamwork, good teamwork. <laughs> that comment was made by a very unbiased observer. I wanna, I wanna... <laughs> And another one from Will Blackwell, congrats. I also Thanks. wanted to take this opportunity to put a plug in for a webinar that Dr. Wright did for us um, regarding the vaccine and just all types of questions that I think has uh, been a really big hit with our communities. We've shared it nationally. It's just great information to share with residents, family, um, employees, and so forth. So it's been included in our update, but if anyone needs access, 
access to that, please shoot me an email and I'm happy to send that over to you. And thanks again, Dr. Wright, for being on today and for doing that uh, video uh, with us. And and I'd just like to thank everybody for being on this and um, good work, everyone. We're going to get through this. There is definitely a light at the end of the end of the tunnel. It's been a long tunnel, that's for sure. Absolutely. Well, um, we will end a little early today. I would like to uh, move to the next slide just to uh, provide another reminder for everyone about our next call, uh, which we are working on getting um, speakers uh, for that call on February 17th to deal with the issue of mandating employee uh, vaccines. So with that said, um, if there are not any other questions, I will give a, a moment just to see if there are any other issues any, anyone wants to talk about before we end. Dana, this is Melissa. I just wanted to add that it, yes. that next call will give not just um, discussion on mandating or not, but what are the talking points that our members are using with residents who want disclosure around who has been vaccinated and who hasn't on the staff and just a, a better um, a better sense of how members are responding to some of the really difficult questions that residents are asking based on um, staff uh, consent to, to the vaccine. Yes, thank you, Melissa. We'll hope everyone can tune in for that call and we'll be providing more information as we get closer to that date. Thank you all for being on and hope you enjoy the rest of your week.